Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369 0703 768 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Praise the Lord. We want to thank God for this opportunity again to stand here to talk about marriage, which we know that it's very, very crucial to every one of us. And one of the reasons why I find joy in doing this is because I see that God is very, very particular and passionate about us in Nigeria when it comes to the homes. By the grace of God, through some little exposures and readings that I do read, I have seen that several nations of the world today, their marriage and their married institutions have run into serious problems such that when you meet some of the nationals of those countries that are at your age and you ask them whether they want to get married they will simply tell you no they have gone to a point where the marriage institution is no longer attractive it's not they are not interested anymore because Several of these people, they are products of wrong marriages, divorce, broken homes, uh, born outside wedlock, and so many terrible things that the devil has done to the marriage institution. So when you find young people from those nations in the Western world, and even some African countries, the issue of marriage is not exciting to them anymore. But I thank God for my country, Nigeria, and for all of us that the matter of marriage, God has preserved it deliberately and we are all excited about it and we want to get married. How many of us here we want to get married? Let me see your hand in order to confirm. You are planning to get married one day. <laughs> okay. We want to say that marriage is a good thing. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor marriage is a good thing. The reason is because marriage is an institution that is designed by God for mankind. And as we have always noted, we discover that no other creatures that, is, that has life, like goats and other animals and birds and reptiles, they are not allowed to marry. Even though they do mate, they have sex, they have children. Yet, marriage was not designed for them at all. But for mankind, for you and I, God decided to honor us, bless us with marriage. And so, in Genesis chapter 2, in fact, right from chapter 1, we saw that when God said he wants to create man, a being that will we represent him on planet earth. He made them male and female. Especially in verse 27. Says. God so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he. Him male and female. He created he them. Then God blessed them. And God said unto them. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living 
that moves on the earth. Then in chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Hallelujah. So, right from the beginning, we saw that marriage has always been in the heart of God. In that verse 28, even though we can read so many things out of that passage, we can clearly see that there was something that looked like a wedding. Because the Bible says, And the Lord blessed them and said unto them. That's what we normally do during wedding. We bless the couple. Even though, as at Genesis chapter 1, they were not yet physically present. God has already concluded the matter of marriage and home for mankind. So we know that the matter of marriage lies squarely in the, in the hand of God and it is central to the purpose of God. And for several other scriptures that we know, we know that God desired to see a man and a woman legally married and for a purpose. So, we said therefore that um, marriage is meant to be a platform to enable the man and his wife to fulfill God's pop eternal purpose on earth. And we always said that that purpose is that God wants to build his kingdom. We saw that when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he said they should pray that God's kingdom will come where his will is done on earth exactly as it is in heaven. So that gives us an insight that the reason why God chose planet earth was to extend his kingdom of righteousness, of holiness, of peace here. And man has been charged, mankind has been charged with the responsibility of ensuring that it happened. Not with angels. Angels are not given that job to come and build God's kingdom here. Animals are not given that mandate. It is mankind and especially the man and his wife. They are better placed to advance God's kingdom. So let me say right away that if you are ever thinking of marriage, which is a good thing, if you are thinking of getting married, which is a, a right thing, which is in line with the, uh, the desire of God for each and every one of us, know that marriage is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. And it is meant to serve as a platform for advancing God's kingdom. The man and his wife understanding that they are here as God's representative. And they wake up and sleep every day with the desire and determination to build God's kingdom of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. In summary, that is it. So marriage is not just men oh, uh, to enjoy. And, and you, re, you will agree with me. That one of the reasons why marriages are failing all over the world is when the man and his wife or young men and young women who want to get married at your level, when they miss that understanding, there are likely chances that the marriage is already doomed to fail. Because God is not obligated to sustain a marriage that is not existing for his purpose. God is not bound but when God finds a man and a woman like uh, Mary and Joseph, like Jochebed and Amram, like Zachariah and Elizabeth, who are sold out to pursue God's purpose, God back them. God support them. God sustain them. God blesses them. God protects them. So, it is a lifelong union between a man and a woman in the pursuit of God's assignment for their lives. We want to say that marriage, once you enter into it, it is expected to last until death occur and take one of the partners away and then later on, the other one follows suit. Marriage is not a, uh, a like, like something like boyfriend and girlfriend that you just end, you pick a girl and you move with her for six months and when you don't like her again, you drop her, you go for another one. No. That is why when you want to get married, there are so many things that are involved. Apart from asking the 
hand of the lady in uh, uh, his hand on in marriage you need to go and meet her parents you need to bring your own family they need to agree the community need to be informed it's not something that is done uh, secretly it's not done in the night it's not done when you are just waking up from dream even though you will tell us that you saw it in a dream it has to be a reality for us for it to be a marriage don't tell us that we got married in dream so it's a lifelong union and the, the fact that divorce is so rampant in our world today does not change this fact jesus said if any man marry and divorce he has committed adultery and if that woman marry another man both the man and the woman they are living in adultery and no adulterer shall enter into the kingdom of god so i want you to perish the thought in your heart that you are ever thinking that where well, if you get married and the thing is not working out well you can get out of it that can never uh, be the purpose of god for your life and that should not be and it will not be in jesus name and the fact that some of us came out from broken homes does not in any way justify it at all now that we are christians maybe our parents they didn't know they didn't know god and god overlooked their ignorance but those of us god doesn't want us to run into that problem that's why why we are still young why marriage is still far away i we are, we are aware that some of us we may not get married the next three years four years yet god is already laying the foundation so that you don't run into the trouble of ever thinking of divorce because the expiry date of every marriage is death death till death do them part hallelujah marriage is meant to serve as a prototype of the mystical union between christ and his church when you read ephesians chapter 2 we're told that the marriage between husband and wife especially christians is meant to as a symbol of the mystical union between christ and the church and that's very serious it is to show the harmonious relationship you know that exists between christ and the church and in fact that exists between the godhead when you find a christian marriage that understands the purpose of god and they are living when you come around them you can feel the 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 peace you can feel the warmth of love and all that that's what god wants to see everywhere and i want you to imagine if god succeed in all of us here having christian marriages it is like heaven on earth hallelujah now we want to briefly talk about um, what marriage is not marriage is not an idea of any man you know why we are saying that because every culture in the world they get married and they have twisted marriage as if it is their own idea no like we are all here now we, we come from different different culture yorubas Igbos, uh Aosa, Ichekiri, Ijo. we are all allowed to marry but it is not our culture that created marriage because many times we allow culture to influence either our choice of partner or to influence the activities in our home or to influence the direction of the marriage i want you to know that as christians culture is not even though we recognize culture especially those that are not contradicting the bible culture is a creation of man so marriage is not an idea or creation of man or any culture only god created it and those who desire to enter into it must of necessity seek to do so through godly means and principles and in every marriage there is an expectation of god marriage is not just an expectation of society like your mother will say i want to have uh, grandchildren all the people that uh, we came where we we you we born together when you were born they now have children when are you giving me my own grandchildren it is not just an expectation of parents 
or say you are of age or you are, you are saying eh, I just want to get married so that I can have somebody who will, who will take care of me I want you to know that much more than that there are things that God wants to reap from every marriage of his children for instance it is a platform for raising godly offspring that is children both biologically and spiritually who will serve him and perpetuate his ordinances from generation to generation like now we thank god that he's returning back the era of discipleship we are beginning to discover again that apart from our own biological children which god expects us to raise in godly way god also gives us opportunity to 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 multiply disciples these are the ones we refer to as our godly offspring there are so many children all over the place that are that are that don't have godly parents that are seeking to be helped to be raised and it is the christian couples that god wants to rely on to produce such godly offspring that will become disciples that will perpetuate the ordinances and the purpose of god on planet earth so when god was saying be fruitful and multiply he knew what he was saying he was expecting that even if brother moses and his wife you know agree to have five children that is still too small compared to the number of children that he wants to raise through our hands hallelujah so if you are planning to get married i want you to know because we are in an era where people don't normally want to have many biological children nowadays i don't know how many of you are planning to have five like me eh oh thank you thank you clap for yourself look at the whole of this <laughs> these these rest of you that are not responding how many do you want to have <laughs> Let me even ask, how many of you, you don't want at all? Let me see your hand. You don't want any child. Oh, there's a hand there. Yes. I have found some people in Europe who told me they don't want children. Plenty of them. So, there's somebody there. But as long as you are a Christian, even if you decide not to have a biological child, that does not in any way excuse you. You must multiply spiritual offspring for the kingdom of God. If you, this, if you are barren in that, you, you risk even your journey to heaven. Because spiritual barrenness endangers our journey to heaven. Because Jesus said, any branch in me that does not produce fruit, what does the Father do to it? Cut it off. Biological barrenness is not a big matter before God. If you get married and you didn't have children, that will not stop you from going to heaven. But if you get married and you did not produce spiritual offspring, I am afraid. I'm not sure whether God will welcome you with, with smile. So marriage is a platform to raise godly offspring who will continue the work after the couple would have left the stage. Hallelujah. Now, I also want to say that marriage is a, an earthly affairs whether your marriage work well or not it will end here the reason why we need to state that is that so that when you are approaching it you will approach it from an understanding that look is one is one is one affair that is like a dice which you have only one chance of playing it and every dice has two sides to it the the good and the bad or head or tail as the case may be and when you are going to play it you need to play it very well because it can determine your destiny and if you miss it here don't say well if i miss marriage here i will marry when i get to heaven you know those people that are killing people today we are told that why they are doing that one of the reasons why they are doing that, they, they have been promised that when they kill people, they will be given seven virgins. I don't know who is telling them that kind of story. Of course, did I say I don't know? 
Don't we know? We know who is telling them that kind of story. What is the name of that man telling that kind of story? Mr. Satan. But thank God we have been delivered from the hand of Satan. Now, we want to quickly move to what we think is very critical to highlight for you. And that is knowing God's will in the choice of a life partner. Which is one of the reasons why we are putting this seminar at this point in time. Because we know that maybe by next year now, or in two years' time, some of you would have already got hooked or even married. Eh? Eh, okay. So, because we may not be there when you are making your choice, we would like to give you some guidelines which we know will be of help to you. In addition to what we are going to say, because time is not on our side, there is a series of tapes that Brother Gbile has preached on guidelines on the choice of life partner. If you go to any of our bookshops, they will be able to arrange it for you. So you can get a copy and listen to them also. Now, um, basically, when you are beginning to think about, you know that you want to get married. Those of you that know that you are, one day you are going to get married, we said there are steps. Now that you are a Christian, the first thing is not marriage as soon as you got born again. The first thing is that as a young sister, as a young brother whom God has saved, like he saved me when I was 21, your first priority now is to grow your spiritual life. What I said, developing a personal, functional relationship with God. Develop root. Sometimes we always tell the sisters, you know, to build a home weigh heavily on you as a, as a lady. We men, once we get married, as far as the home front is concerned, it's as if you are a hunter who has hunted down an animal you are running to catch another one. How to arrange the home to make sure the home is running weigh heavily on the woman. Don't forget that in addition to making sure that you are cooking, you are cleaning, you are arranging everything, is pregnancy and nurturing babies. These are things that if you don't take time now to develop your Christian life, they are very correct reason to make your spiritual life finish. So now that you are not yet married, it is time to develop your prayer life. It is time to develop your uh, how, to, how to read the Bible. There are some of you that have seen that sometimes when you are reading the Bible, even the King James you are reading, you don't even know how to read it very well. Go and get a simpler one. NIV, good news. If you are in love with King James, you can still have a King James version that when you read, then you use the other one to, uh, to understand the archaic words, some of the archaic words that King James have used. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. You know them. <laughs> thou. Uh -huh. <laughs> thou knowest. Seest. Uh -huh. So, get very, very familiar with how to do your own personal Bible study. There are some things that we are dis distributing in this conference. That is um, your new beginning in Christ. For instance, that kind of small handbook, you don't need many people to study it. Get two versions of the Bible and you are following it sequentially. It is not that you are not married, that such things are easy. Develop you know, your prayer life. Know how to fast and pray. You know, know how to do your personal devotion. Waking up by 5 a.m. At your level now, waking up at 6 a.m. Is, is too late for you. You need to learn how to wake up on time like Jesus Christ used to do. So that by the time you, you, you are settling down in marriage, you would have gotten used to it. It has become part of you. I remember that when I was in the university, I used to wake up anyhow, anytime I like. Until one brother 
Oh, it's of blessed memory now. He used to be our vice president that year when I was in second year. In early in the morning, he would come and knock my window around 5 a.m. on the dot. We just knock my window in the hostel. Brother Moses say yes, please open the door. And then he will come to my room with Bible, with daily devotion, and he will sit with me, and we will read the Bible together. We will pray together. We will, he will teach me. You know, that was how I started. When he came one, two, three times, I didn't want to be waiting for him to wake me up anymore. So by the time he is knocking my window, I'm, I'm already up. And that thing has followed me till now. So you need to develop how to wake up on your own, do your own devotion, and grow in it. Learn how to fast as a Christian, not just group fasting. Learn how to hear from God. And you can, only, you can know that by just knowing the mind of God. You see how God uh, uh, interprets things in the Bible. What God frowns at. What God approves. What God recommends. So when you are now going through those situations, you just know the mind of God. It's better than when you just go to sleep and dream. And you just depend on those dreams that even the devil can manipulate. So that when it comes to the time you are going to get married, it will not be difficult for you to know where God is pointing you to the particular brother or to the particular sister. It is now you should do that. The next thing that is very important to you is discovering the purpose of God for your life. Each and every one of us that is seated here, there is a thing that you are meant to do for God. There is a reason why you are made a man. There is a reason why you are made a woman. There is a reason why you are made an African. There is a reason why you are in the university. Why God is giving you this opportunity. There is a reason why you are even saved now that you are not yet married. Then, find out that particular reason. It is not another person that will discover it for you. It is between you and God. And you can get to know the purpose of God for your life by this personal relationship with God. As you develop it, as you are praying, as you are studying the word of God, you will just see that what God has planned for you to do in this world is there in the Bible. And the day you stumble into them like Jesus did. The Bible said one day he just came to the synagogue and then as his custom was, they gave him a scroll and then he opened to what is now known as Isaiah 61. You see Isaiah 61? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to release the captive. And when he has finished, he told the audience, say, this scripture is fulfilled in me today. I have discovered that it is not only Jesus that that experience is supposed to apply to all of us. I have personally discovered several passages in the Bible that speak about my destiny. That's why I'm here today as a preacher and not as somebody who is running after my career. Personally, I, want to, I wanted to run with my career and my career was growing well. But as I was seeking to know the purpose of God for my life, God now revealed to me and made me to understand that my career was just part of his purpose, but that was not the final thing that I was supposed to do. That my education was meant to prepare me for what I am going to do, just like it was for Moses in the Bible. So it is important that you, you discover the call of God on your life so that when the time of marriage comes, you will be able to discern correctly which particular brother, which particular sister you can spend the rest of your life together. Because it is not every brother that can marry every sister. We are made to do different things. There are some, you see, there's something I've seen in the Bible. When you read Bible, you will see that in a, a whole book, book of Exodus, book of Numbers, book of Deuteronomy, is focused on the activities of one man. Every, almost every chapter, verses, you will see the name Moses. What he did, if he coughed, it's written there, if he, whatever he did. You will see the book of Joshua, the same thing. You will see the, several books. But there are also people in the Bible. All that they did, they only summarize it in one, in one verse. There's one man in the Bible. That man's name looked like a Yoruba name. He said, Tola. <laughs> in the book of Judges, <laughs> they said he ruled Israel so, so very many number of years. 
But they use one verse. Just one verse of scripture to describe his many years of serving God. There are people like that. That they are only going to do one thing for God. And that is it. But there are other people that they are going to do this, they are going to do this, they are going to do this, they are going to do this. To do this. Now, that has implication on your marriage. So that's why it is important for you to discover the purpose of God ever before you start paying too much attention into your marriage matter, especially in the choice of a life partner. And we also said, uh, let me quickly, they are, they are giving you the paper, so the scriptures are there, Acts 6, 9, where Paul was saying, Lord, what will you have me to do? And in Jeremiah, we saw God declaring that before I form you, I have already known you, I have ordained you to be a prophet. Everything that Jeremiah was going to do is contained in that Jeremiah chapter 1. And when you now read the rest of the book of Jeremiah, you will see the fulfillment of what God told him when he was young. So, it's also supposed to happen to each and every one of us like that. That you will understand whether God is calling you to be a politician, whether God is calling you to be in academics, whether God is calling you to be a a full-time ministers of the gospel like those of us sitting here, whether God is calling you to be um, a businessman for him, whether God is calling you to be a missionary, all this, they are there for you to discover. Don't say, I don't know what I came to do in this world though. It is not correct for you to speak like that. We also said, it is important for you to grow into certain level before you start jumping into marriage. Like, at this your level now, that you are in school. Marriage shouldn't be a priority for you, especially you are still in school, somebody is paying your school fees, somebody is clothing you, somebody is feeding you, and you are still coming back to tell your father that you have seen somebody you want to marry. <laughs> I have a son who is here. He's in third year in the university. I know how God is helping us small, 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 small to take care of him. I'm just imagining if he come home now and say, Dad, I think God is leading me to one sister. <laughs> so please, you need to grow to a certain level of both physical, spiritual, social maturity because marriage carries a weight that is going to demand your stability for you to run as a, a husband or a wife. So, your education will contribute to that stability. So, face your book now. You are just in third year or second year and somebody is proposing to you now. I think you should tell that person you are not yet ready. Finish your book. And if you are meant for that man, Jesus said, all that the father has he a for me shall surely come to me. Sometimes people rush into marriage. They say, if I don't do it now, somebody else will catch that person. No, it's lack of faith. There is a time for everything under the sun. There is a time to school and there is a time to marry. Hallelujah. I don't want to spend much time on section B because we have said some things about it. Just to say that if you, are a believer, if you are a believer that has been growing well, as we have said, for some time, you would have become acquainted with the ways of God. In his dealing with his children, God generally leads. He guides. He speaks. He arranges situations. He appears to people. He prevents people from doing certain things. He motivates. He inspires. He mobilizes. He presses things in, 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 in our heart. He convicts when we are wrong. And even when we need to do something, he reveals things to us, he interprets. So it's not a difficult thing if you are growing well as a Christian. When people say, I don't know how God speaks, I don't know, I don't hear, I don't, it's because you are not growing well. Unfortunately, in our churches today, they are not really teaching us this kind of thing. So that's why we have put it here. And there are several scriptures we have written down there, different ways by which God speaks. Chief of them, which is the written word. Why the written word is the chief of them is because every other thing shall pass away but the word of god remain so whether you dream or you hear prophecies or vision or somebody is counseling you if it does not agree with the word of god then that may not be 
the will of God for your life. So get very addicted to the word of God. Get very familiar with the word of God. Get very, you know, acquainted with the word of God. So there are other things that we have written down there which can help you when your time comes. Now, where to choose a life partner? Or again, they are all written there. We don't need to waste much time there. But just to say that a Christian, you generally need to choose from the Christian community. And Christian community or Christian family, they are found all over the world. Like we are all here now. Even though we are from different tribes, but we belong to one Christian family. Because in Christ, there is no Jew, no Gentile, no Greek, no barbarian. In Christ, no Yoruba, no Igbo, no Jukun, no Hausa. We are all one in Christ. That's the first determinant. So if an unbeliever is coming to you and saying, I just want to marry you like we were watching one of the Mount Zion film. An unbeliever was somebody that was not really, we are not sure was born again, was telling his sister, a, a very well, you know, you know, growing sister, that he, he wanted to marry her. And the sister was telling the man that, look, you, you are not born again. Don't you know I am a born again Christian? And the man said, that is actually the reason. That every other girl that he has seen is because they are not born again that he's running away from them. He himself is not born again, no. That kind of a thing is very serious. And I was surprised that even though he spoke like that, this so-called sister still went ahead to marry this man. And if you watch that uh, film, I will recommend it for you. What's the name of that film? The Story of My Life. How many of you have watched it? Aha. Very powerful drama. So, when a non-believer is approaching you for marriage, you are not supposed to give it any thought at all because light and darkness, are they, are they ever friends? They are not friends at all. Once light goes off, darkness will come. And once light, light comes, darkness will disappear. So, in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, the Bible describes, you know, the status of unbelievers and Christians. Hallelujah. So, um, you are not to choose anybody that has backsliding. You are not to choose a polygamist. You are not to choose somebody who has married before and is telling you a story that where his wife was very stubborn and he has to continue with his life. He almost died in the marriage and he's telling you stories. Tell him you are not meant for a polygamist. You are not to choose a divorcee, no matter how the story is looking sweet. If you marry a divorcee, Jesus said, you have committed adultery. We put recent converts here because... It's not that it's a sin to marry a recent convert. You know, a babe, when you, when you give birth to a baby, he is, he is needing help in every way. Even to raise his hand. You have to raise his hand. You have to put cloth on him. When he wants to urinate, you have to help the baby. You have to clean it up. You have to dress him up. You have to do everything. You have to put food for his mouth. And even when he's, he's, the baby has swallowed the food, you have to shake so that the, the food will go down. That is how <laughs> a, a recent convert is. If you are going to marry a recent convert, it's not different because if you marry him or her, when you say, let us pray, who will do the prayer? You. If you say, let's read the Bible, who go, who go read the Bible? I have been following, I, I have friends that, that were not too grown in the Lord. That was when I, I had the Insight to what a recent convert can be. When, this man is, is older than me, very educated, a public person, but he, he got born again. So we became friends. Anytime I went to him, when I say, let's read the Bible, I am the one to choose where to read. So when we read it, finish, I explain, I, put, I give the ally, I say, so what is your question? He said, no, you have said everything. <laughs> he says, it's okay. <laughs> there's nothing to add. And 
When I say let us pray, say no, pray for us. <laughs> so I don't know if you marry such a person, how long? And when, when I wake up, I would have done my quiet time, he's still sleeping. I had to wake him up, and I would say, let's do quiet time. I say, no, when you finish, we pray together. So if you are ready to do that, no, no problem. So, um, that's why we say, be careful when you are marrying a recent convert. There are other things we say you should put into consideration, like tribe. They are both positive and negative. Why we say, oh, in Christ, there is no Yoruba, there is no Igbo. If you are an Igbo man, you are going to marry a Yoruba girl. What we simply say is that, don't say you will not marry, don't say you will not marry the Igbo man because he's Igbo and you are Yoruba. That's what we say you, you shouldn't say. But you must recognize that this person, being a Yoruba girl, if you are coming to their house for the first time and you want to greet her parents, what must you do? Eh? You can't say, hey, good evening, sir. <laughs> you can't say. <laughs> I mean, that man will just send you out of his house. Uh -huh. Because, like me, I am from Edo State, but my wife well, is an evil woman. When I wanted to, when I see the father for, uh, for the first time, I just entered their house and I, I shook hands with the man. There was no problem. He was the one who even brought his hand and said, welcome. And I, I shook hands with him. And he said, sit down. I said, thank you, sir. But if he, I imagine that if he was a Yoruba man. <laughs> you know, when I was, when I was doing my youth service, I saw the way my brethren, because we serve in the, in the north, and we were all from different parts of Nigeria. One day I was discussing with my Yoruba brethren. I told them that if I'm going to marry a Yoruba girl, I will not do ballet. They said, eh, Brahmoses. Why? I said, I will tell them that I'm from America. <laughs> and they told me that, look, you don't try it. Even if you are from the moon, you must do ballet. So if you are not ready to do ballet, Pray that you don't fall in love with a Yoruba sister. So I know what we are saying is that you don't reject somebody because of culture. Just recognize uh, what you need to do and um, that is not offensive to the gospel. Age gap, social status, we have put some few things there. Outlooks, that is one thing that we want to say. Be careful because... The Bible says, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. When you want to get married, there is a tendency for all of us, I was once like that, that the first thing you want to consider is usually outward appearance. Is the man tall or is the lady tall? Does she have pointed nose? Does he have uh, long legs? Is she fair? But we have come to note that the Bible says beauty is deceitful or is vain. I think there is a scripture like that in Proverbs 31. You see, beauty is, is, is what? Is deceitful and favor is vain. You see, but the woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. The, God, the man that feareth the Lord, Bible says, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. Hallelujah. So, you need to be careful in using outward looks to pick a life partner because when you enter into the marriage, what you need most is the life, the Christ life that is in your partner that affects you so much. It's not whether he's tall or he's handsome or he's that. That doesn't play much role. So, just ask the Lord to choose a woman for you that is godly. Because the Bible said, houses are, and where they are inherited from the fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. I think that's Proverbs 19.14. Then, there are other issues we raised there. 
uh, educational gap, denominational affiliations, personal attitude, and God's perfect will. Why we put these things is that over time, as we are sitting down to counsel people that have married, we discover that those issues that we have overlooked over time, if they are not well handled, they create terrible problems for couples. For instance, educational gap. If you are a, it's happening very rampantly now. You have ladies who are graduates. They, some of them even have masters. And then a, a man who didn't finish secondary school. There are several girls of his, of his level, educationally, that he would have laid hands on. But he's laying hands on a, on a master's degree holder. That ordinary shouldn't have been a problem since we say it's Christ that is the issue. But then, the same man, because of his lack of education, his mind is not properly developed. Some of them, they don't give their wives who had the opportunity of education to operate properly. It becomes a matter, if the lady is speaking from his informed position, say, shut up here, you do know. And things like that create a lot of problems. So, and they undermine education as if education is not important. So let me caution you, ladies, whereas we will not say don't marry somebody who is not educated. If somebody that is coming for you, and say, thus says the Lord, and there's no problem about that, the issue of education needs to be discussed. How do we handle this? First of all, look at your own grace. Whether you have the grace to live with a man that is not, is not, is not uh, processed intellectually. Because sometimes it is the woman who is the problem. She knew the man before she married him, and now it's a shame for her to be introducing him because when her friends who are lawyers and doctors, they come with their husband and they are introducing their husband, she, she will be looking down her, her own husband. That is not correct. So that's why we are putting it there that you need to look at those little, little issues, social status, and so on. I mean, um, denominational affiliations. We have also run into some serious problems about, even though we are also saying we belong to the body of Christ. There are so, some denominations that are old exception to certain things. Now, if you are going to marry somebody like that, let it be discussed. I don't want to cite you know, many examples because of time, but you know what I'm talking about. Personal attitude. What we mean here is that it's not enough for you to just jump into marriage with somebody who exhibits some attitude that you may not be able to put up with. For instance, we said some people are very passionate about different things. They are passionate about sports, fashion, money, career, media. They are not passionate about God, and yet they are Christians. They are passionate about politics. They discuss politics. But when you are saying, let's go for MLR. Say MLR. What is MLR? Ministers, leadership, they say, what, is, that, is that not for pastors and all that? Say, no, it's for everybody. Say, ah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to church. It's okay for me. Or you are saying, um, we want to do fasting for 20 days, 21 days. Ah, he's saying, for what? Why? So, and yet, he is very passionate about other things. So, you need to look into that. That's why we, we said, before you get into marriage with somebody, there is a need for courtship. And there is what we call God's perfect will. I would like you to go and read Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. There we notice that God talks about good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That in marriage and in everything that we do, there is something that may be good, but it's not acceptable. There is even something that is good, acceptable, but it's not perfect will of God. We have examples like that in the Bible. Like when the children of Israel left the promised land, the promised land began from the other side of Jordan, not on this side. But when they, as they were traveling and they were meeting those nations that were not 
friendly with them. God gave them opportunity to fight with them and, and conquer their land. But God was not planning that they should settle on this side of Jordan. His desire was that they should cross the river Jordan and then they will occupy the land of the Hittites, the Jebusite, the Gagashite, the Hivites. Not the land of the Amor Amorite, the Moabites, and the, those other lands. But even though they conquered the lands. However, the Bible told us that the Rubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they were not ready to move to the other side. They said, we will settle here. There is no need to cross. Now, as we are reading that story, we knew that God just permitted them. It was good, but it was not God's perfect will for them. God's perfect will for them was to cross the river Jordan. Now, when you marry according in that, on that principle of permissive will, you will be the one to suffer the consequences. So, seek for somebody that is perfect will for your life. Who will go far with you? Who will help you to fulfill God's purpose? Come rain, come sun. Who will stay with you whether there is money or there is no money? Who will stay with you for better, for worse, in sickness and in health? Who will stay with you and even when there is wealth, that doesn't affect the marriage negatively. So you need somebody like that. That is what God desires for each and every one of us. I'm thinking that I should stop here because whatever is left, uh, probably as we are attempting the questions, we will be able to touch them. Thank you very much. What we want to do is, since we have written out questions, the, the team here is sorting them out, and uh, my wife and my colleagues here, they will be attending to those questions that you have put forward, those ones that are very critical. So I will hand over the microphone. Somebody has talked on this thing today. Are you ready? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, where, where, where are we going? We have not finished. That's what I was talking about. Young men. They want to go somewhere. Now, there are so many questions here that we are, we are harassed by some of the questions. We don't know where to start. Um, hi, did you identify any of the serious ones? Okay. All right. Okay, I think it's the same person himself. He said, must God choose or speak to you about your life partner? Can someone not get married to someone that comes across to you and you find him or her good and nice? And just go for the person. Go for him or go for her. Um, I wish I wish the person was standing in front of me. I will have asked. I think it's enough questions. Don't bring any more questions. It's enough. The ones here, if we sit down here until Jesus comes back, we will not finish it. It's enough. Please don't write any more questions. It's enough. We, we, with all this, self, we don't know now, it's obvious to me, and that's one thing that has been troubling me as I'm looking, that majority of those of us who are thinking of going into marriage, we have no idea about the complexities of marriage. Let me ask you a question. 
Look at the... If you are sitting beside a sister, look at her face. If it's be a brother, look at his face. Look, just look. Look, look at the face. Look at the forehead. That place that is very flat. Now, let me ask you a question. What did you see that is written there? Eh? Look very well. Look. So, let me ask you a question. Do you know which brother that after you marry, five years after you marry, you will discover that his mother is a witch? Do they write it on their forehead? Now, let me know. Tell me, which of the sisters around you is not looking nice? Eh? Is there plenty are not looking nice? Can you know from a nice face whether the mother-in-law is a witch or not? Can you know? Eh? Which sister do you know that after she gives birth to her first child, she's going to die when she's giving birth to a child? Do they write it on their forehead? So, the matter of somebody is looking nice, uh, it just shows the level of your thinking. You do not realize that they... I should read it along. Since we are to seek for the, the face of God first in marriage, does love have any real influence on the will of God? What if a man doesn't love the will of God for his life? Don't bring more questions. So. Praise the Lord. So, why do we need to seek the will of God? A very simple answer is that you don't know tomorrow. You cannot know a man from his face. You can't even know him from his English, from the way he speaks. Do you know the majority of the things that we use to choose a life partner? They are external things. They don't speak about the person inside. There are very fine sisters. Very pretty. Yellow face, straight legs, all those things that you normally talk about. Wait until you marry them, you will know that you are marrying a lazy woman. And she will, she will be fine for you to marry. But when you are married down into the house, your house will be dirty. Your children will be unkempt. Everything will be upside down. Every day she will do pancake for you and go and show, show her face. And you will be alright. But every other aspect of the life, everything is nothing. So it's good for you to wait on the Lord to choose for you. The second reason is that it's not every man that is even correct, that is meant for you. The Bible says, He that made them at the beginning, made them how? Male and female. There is a perfect will of God for your life. There is somebody that God has ordained for you to marry. And if you don't pick that person, you will be a misfit. He will not fit. You will not fit into his life. If you choose with the, with the sight of your eyes, the very likelihood is that you are going to choose wrongly. Uh, there is only one, and I normally tell my children, I say, the secret of a, success, uh, of a successful marriage, I can divide it into two. Every successful home is 50% correct choice that you got the right person. If you got the right person in marriage, you have already passed 50% of the chance of making a success of that home because you will fit. Many things will be settled naturally because God has chosen the person that fits you perfectly. 
many issues of compatibility, issues of I like this, I don't like that, God will have settled it without your knowing. God will have chosen the person that fits. It's like you, 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 you put a 13 ounce plug inside the 13 ounce socket. How does it enter? Shinku. But imagine that you, you are a 13 ounce plug and you want to marry a 15 ounce socket. You have to bring hammer and chisel to crack and bend and force and in the process of wanting to plug it what happens to one of them one will scatter so when you have made a correct choice up to 50 percent of chance of succeeding is already set to the second 50 percent is now left to operating your marriage by correct principles the first one is correct choice the second one is what correct principles there is a way a man is that a woman must understand how to relate with the man there is a way a woman behaves in certain situations that if as a man you don't understand you will always be having problems so if you chose by your sight and you have already chosen the wrong person 50 percent of chance of succeeding is already lost i want to beg you to allow God to choose for you. I asked them, I will finish now and hand over the microphone. When we were talking about this in South Africa, I asked them a question. I said, supposing I want to buy, Christmas is coming, and my, and my, I want to buy a suit for my 12-year-old boy. Let's assume I have a 12-year-old boy and I want to buy a suit for him. There are two ways we can get that suit, isn't it? As the father, I can go to the supermarket and say, I know what is good for my son. And go and pick the right suit and pay for it and bring it home to him. On the other hand, I can also say, well, 12 years old, you are old enough to choose for yourself. Take money. Maybe I even go with him to the supermarket while I am buying some other uh, adult things. I tell him to run to the suit section and go and pick a suit and pick, and pick a dress for himself. What do you think is likely to be the difference between our two choices? Eh? If a 12-year-old boy is going to pick a suit, what are likely to be his considerations? Eh? Color? Eh? Size? He may not even think of size. Style. Eh? Style. Which kind of color is he likely to pick? Bright color, like red or yellow or pink. Now, but as a father, if I'm going to be picking a suit for my son, what are likely to be my own considerations? Eh? Quality, durability, eh? and price. Some of you, you will marry a sister that is too costly to maintain. Let me tell you a personal story quick. When I wanted to marry, I wanted to pick a wife. There was one sister I wanted to marry before I met my wife. Very fine sister. She's a Christian. She's everything. And then uh, when I started praying, Lord, this sister, one day when I really got serious, I said, Lord, you are not speaking to me about this sister. God said, should I tell you the truth? I said, yes. I said, she's my daughter. She's not a bad sister. She's, uh, she's okay. She's going to be a Christian for long and everything. There's no problem about, about her. But there is one matter that will not make me to give her to you. I said, what is that? I said, you cannot maintain her. I said, ah. he said, ah. her mind is too costly. Her choices are costly. Her sights are for very high, she has a very high taste. And what I'm planning for you, today you will be in the bush, tomorrow you will be in another place. You cannot cope. 
That was over 25 years ago, over 30 years ago, actually. And now I still know that sister. I am still in touch with her. She's, today she's in England. Another day she's in Amsterdam. She's flying everywhere from here to there to there. Can I tell you the bad part? She's not married. She can't marry because every man that comes around her, they can't. She's, she's, she's still a Christian. She's doing well. Career was. But she, she's not married up to today. I imagine I had uh, carried that one. We won't be here on this table today. You want me to answer this one also? Six men came to say, God says you are my wife. They are all Christians. And people you know that God is really using them in the society. <laughs> now, they are all saying God chose you for a godly sister. How come? Is it that God is using them to prove something? Or what can you say about this? I don't know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let me say something to you. If six brothers are all rushing for you at the same time, it may likely be one or two things. And I hope you will listen to me. It could be positive. It could be negative. It could be positive because maybe they can see grace and virtue. They see that you are growing well. They see the virtues and the qualities of a good wife. And everybody wants to get a good wife to marry. Now, those brothers are usually not patient to find out from God. So all of them will zoom at this one that they are seeing. As a sister, can I beg you? If you notice that everywhere you go, I have had many daughters like that. Especially those daughters that have yellow skin. Yellow face. I don't know problem with brothers and yellow skin. I have some daughters like that. Everywhere she enters, with, before she stays there for one month, somebody will catch a vision. And I told her, I said, it's just your yellow skin. Don't worry about them. It's all of them. Now, but on the other hand, it could also be that as a sister, you are careless. You are over generous with your affection. You are the kind that uh, everybody you see, you say, ah, good morning, brother. You, are, you, are, you, are, you, grieve, you give free hugs. You know what we used to call them in our days? Anima shao. Generous with everything. Maybe you are too frivolous. Maybe you are exposing parts of your body. And carnal, carnal brothers who have not mastered their, their passions. They see a girl that they know they can quickly catch. And they are all rushing for you. Can I say to you categorically that it is not the will of God for six brothers to marry you? <laughs> Am I correct? Five, at least five of them are in the flesh. It is even possible that all six of them are wrong. So if six brothers are rushing after you like that, withdraw. Cover yourself. Maybe you are too exposed. Put a veil over your life and your activities. Stop saying, I like brothers. I like the company of brothers. Some sisters cannot read except with boys. They say, I don't like sisters. Sisters talk too much. I like relating with boys. Something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. Put a veil over your head. Withdraw yourself. Go into the cooler. Ask God, God, what is, what is my problem? I had a young, I had a, young uh, a daughter many years ago. She's married now. Thank God she's properly married and she's married to one of my fine sons. But in those days, whenever she's going to school, you know, before three months, somebody will be... Gone in for her. She's a fine Christian. 
So they even lecturers. They are beginning to say, hey, you see. Ah. So she came one day and said, hey, Daddy, I don't know the problem. Everywhere I go, hey, they are always coming to me. I say, I say, actually, I have been meaning to tell you, but I will tell you now. When she's going to class, she will dress properly. In those days, we don't, they do, she doesn't even dress to expose her body, but all her dress is to match. Cute. She dresses as if she's going for a, a social function. She's serious minded, but her dressing is careless. Her dressing is inviting. So everybody that sees her, every head that sees her, turns to, to look at her three times. I said, if you don't want everybody to be running after you, tone down your dressing. Tone down your dressing. Keep yourself covered until the right man comes for you. Or else, you will fall into the wrong hands. I thank God she took my advice. And she, you know, in those days, she will do her hair nicely. She may go and put a flower somewhere. <laughs> she will do done something, something. You, you know, the bangles, the same color with her shoe. And everything, I say, uh, sister, you are the one advertising yourself. What did I say she's doing? It's advertisement. I see several of you, you are going, and today is even worse. You are exposing your private parts. You wear dresses that are so tight that it does not need any imagination to know the contours of your body. And you say, hey, that's the trend. Now, if you, who told you that you must buy those dresses? And you know some of them, when they are wearing the dress, you know, they will be stretching the thing. They will wear the, the, the skirt. And then when they sit down, you see them doing like this. And then they are pulling. I say, don't tear this skirt now. You know it's too short before you wore it. If you didn't intend to show us everything, why didn't you cover it from the house? So if you are doing that, why will Kana brothers not rush for you? And um, you are telling me that they are all, God is using them in the society. Which kind of that use is that? It's Kana brothers that are all rush for the same sister. In fact, by the time the third, fourth, fifth person comes to you, just tell him, don't see the Lord, you are Kana. Go and be spiritual. Leave me alone. Let God speak to me so that you don't run into a wrong situation. All right, Sister Anne? Anyone? There are so. Eh? The questions are there are too diverse and too many. When you want to select a life partner, should you consider blood group or not? Blood group. Alright. What are the implications of marrying a geno genetically incompatible person? Now, Um, can I say to you praise the Lord now you see it's because you don't know the meaning of God's perfect way I know the problem of several of us is that we don't know how to hear from God all the considerations even as we were talking uh, social, social status a certificate, this, that, that you need to consider. There are not issues to talk about when you are choosing a life partner. There are issues that become relevant in courtship. There are issues that you will sit down to consider and resolve after you have first of all ascertained that this person is the will of God. I don't know what you understand what, what I'm talking about. That when you say something is the will of God, it means God, the omnipotent, the omniscient, 
the one who knows the end from the beginning is the one who chose this. Can it be wrong? The problem is that many of you say God said. When, honestly, if you go to God, you say, I don't know anything about it. Oh. It is his eyes that, that led him. So, somebody like me, in fact, let me tell you the truth. I did not know my genotype until I was 35 years of age. I didn't know it. I didn't know it. So, all those issues of uh, genotype and this and that and that, fine. I know there are churches now that they will say, before you marry, you have to go and do genotype. If your church demands that, fine. But all of that are remedial means. Remedial means of making sure that in case they make a mistake, let's make sure that this, 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 this are in place. But if we, if we chose the will of God, I can assure you it will be perfect. There won't be a problem with it. If you have met, if you have known the will of God, if you choose the correct thing. Praise the Lord. So, um, it's okay. Go and check the blog group. It's compatible. For example, if I was going to use the two of us, we found out that if we, if we went for genotype before we married, they probably wouldn't have allowed us to marry. Because genetically speaking, we are supposed to have problems. We are supposed to have near sickle cell children, all. But we married, we didn't know. We married and we gave birth to children. Let me tell you that genet genetically speaking also, the fact that you are even AS and the other person is AS does not mean you will most compulsively have an SS. It's probability. And you can also have all of them. SS is probability. We are just saying that each time you meet, there is a 50% chance that it will either be SS or it will not be SS. And God is there. He can choose which egg will fuse with each, which sperm to produce a child. But if the people that are watching over you insist that you should do blood group, fine. The only one that I, I may I may ask you to do is HIV. The reason is that it's not even because it may not be the will of God, but you must be you must be informed. And you must know the implications of it. It can even still be the will of God. There was, I had, I'm, I've been a pastor for several years, there was a lady who was working in an office and he had a a senior officer it was not her boss but she was the bo the brother was slightly senior and this brother was a sickler and every day he he sick he didn't come to office sick then one day he felt the lord said telling him that go and take care of that man why is he always falling sick every time who is taking care of him so he will go they were not married he was a she was a christian the brother was also a christian she would just go go to their home, he would take care of the brother, do this and go away. And she was doing it as just being a Christian. In fact, the brother had concluded that no woman will marry me. Because the frequency of her, of his uh, of crisis was serious. Then, suddenly one day, as she was taking care of she felt, her, she had God saying, actually, I raise you to take care of this man for me for life. Ah! You are going to marry him because you are going to take care of him for life. Hey! Of course, you know she struggled. She prayed. She bound the devil. She did everything. When the thing was not going away, she started talking to her pastors. Ah! The pastor said, are you sure? This? I remember when she came to me, I said, hmm, let's, let's pray very well about this matter. Huh? But when we prayed and everything, we found out that it's the will of God. The brother was the one in our church. The sister was not in our church. The brother was a, our own church member. And eventually, they got married. Some few years after that, I don't know what happened. They, had, eh? they believed God. And few years after that, God healed the brother. In fact, 
they went to do a genotype test and they discovered that the genotype is changed. They are married now, they are doing well. I have married two people before. The sister was hale hearty. Ah, Pastor Adeshegun is here. Was her, was her church member. And the brother was an invalid on top of wheelchair. Paralyzed from here down. Including down. And the sister insisted and said, God spoke to me that I'm the one to marry him. I'm the one who we joined them together in the church. They are doing fine. So when we talk about the will of God, it's not convenience. It's not that I like it. It's not that it's producing something for me. The will of God is beyond you. Praise the Lord. Alright. Can you people answer some question? Speak to us about dating. Answer the questions on dating. Alright, there is a question here that says, what is the difference between courtship and dating? Praise the Lord. Now, there was a, another question that I read, even though I can't find it now, that says that, or maybe somebody read it, that it didn't call it dating per se, but the question was like something like, what is wrong if I just see somebody and I like the person and I decide to marry him or her? Another question I read said, um, if I meet somebody and I like him or her, can I start befriending her first before proposal? And that one actually is the one that relates with the issue of dating. Now, when we are talking about the issue of um, marriage, you know, I was just saying underneath that it's because several of us do not know exactly the purpose for marriage. That's why several of the questions that we are asking are coming up. It's because several of us think that marriage is for you and for what you can get out of marriage. It's because several of us think, ah, marriage is, I must marry a beautiful girl so that I will not be ashamed to introduce her when I get to my friends. Um, for several, whatever other several reasons. Several of the reasons that we are thinking, some of us even think you just get married because you like this person. You are looking for somebody that, um, who is going to be kissing you and going to be pecking you, somebody who will take care of you just because you love this person. That's why you want to marry the person. And that's why several of us have several confusions about the issue of marriage. But the truth of the matter is that, I just want to say this as a basis, the truth of the matter is that marriage, even though it involves two human beings, and we are not saying that you should not love the person that you marry, but the truth of the matter is that marriage is not for our own personal benefit, either as the man or as the woman. The truth is that when God established marriage, he established marriage for a definite reason. It is for the purpose of a woman being a help in the life of a man to fulfill the purpose of God on the life of that man. Marriage is not just for our enjoyment. It's not just for what I can gain from it, what I can get, either as the, as the man or the woman. It is first and foremost for the fulfillment of the purpose of God for our lives. And that was why, as part of our introduction, we said that apart from the issue of um, having a personal relationship with God, either as a man or as a woman, you must again determine the purpose of God for your life. And several things are hanging on that. Until as a man... You discover the purpose of God for your life. I'm wondering why you need a help in your life. I'm wondering what you need a help for. 
The woman in the life of a man is not an idol to be worshipped. The woman in the life of a man is not there for what she can gain and what she can get. Marriage is not for our convenience. I don't like this. I like this. Marriage, actually, just like I said earlier, is primarily for the purpose of fulfilling the call of God on the life of a man, and then he needs a woman to help him to achieve that primarily. So when we come to the, once, once you understand that, the issue of dating does not even come in at all. What is dating? You know, what we call dating is that I like this person for whatever reason and we are going out together. Most of the time when you are dating, what is going on in your heart is that, well, it may end up in marriage, it may not end up in marriage, but at least for now, I'm still trying to consider whether we are compatible or we are not compatible. You are thinking, let me learn her or learn him. Let me know him. Let me know whether I will like him or I will not like her. In fact, some people go, even go to the extent of, as Christians on our campus now, we go to the extent of staying together in the same room, even though we claim to be born again. Several of us do it. We go to the extent of sleeping together. The woman is already in the same room with the brother. She's already cooking. She's already washing clothes. She's already acting as a wife. But, but the truth of the matter is that they have not even come into a commitment to say that we are going to marry one another. That is dating. It is friendship. A relationship that does not have a commitment of marriage yet. We are still thinking about it. And if I date you for one year, one and a half years, and I don't like, and I don't like something about you, I can drop you and start another dating. If I am, I'm going out with you now, and then one day you annoy me, I can say that's the end of it, and then I drop you. Like, I remember a particular sister at one time. She was dating two brothers. And she was trying to find out which one is the will of God, which one is not the will of God. And she said, it is my birthday. Whichever one calls to say happy birthday to me first. Meanwhile, she had been going out with the two of them. So, you discover that there is no commitment, talk less of God being in that relationship. And if you go through the Bible, you will never find anything that looks like dating in the Bible. There is a particular scripture I always like to read. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 14. The Bible says, house and riches are the inheritance of fathers, but only the Lord can give a prudent wife. Only God can give you an understanding wife. Only the Lord can give you a wife that will last long with you. Dating will never. Just like my husband said earlier, there is no way you can go out with a man or a woman and you think you can know that person. You are deceiving yourself. There is no way you can befriend somebody because at that time when you are still dating, you are just friends. No commitment. Everybody is dressing up. When we are going out, I dress up to come and meet you. And I'm careful what I say. I'm careful how I act. We are maybe in an eatery and I'm dressed up. I sit up. I know how to hold my fork and knife. I know how to give a, a smile. I know how to do whatever. And... There can be many, many cover-ups, many, many pretenses. There's only one person who knows you in total. There's only one person who can tell you about the other person. That person is God. He's the only one that knows everything. The Bible says he's Alpha and Omega. He knows the end from the very beginning. You as a human being, you can never know it. Dating can never be correct as a Christian. Now, when we are talking about trusting God to choose for you, 
I know that from my own experience and from several other experiences, several situations that we have handled, if it is God that picks for you, he will not give you somebody that you don't like. If it is God that picks for you, by the time you enter into that relationship, I can assure you, you will like what God has given you. Particularly when you have discovered that marriage is not just for you and what you like and what you do not like. Marriage is for the fulfillment of the will of God. So dating can never give you what God has planned for you. Now, what is the difference between dating and courtship? Courtship actually is when a brother has sought the face of the Lord. You have realized that there is a purpose of God for your life. Even as a man, even as a woman, you have realized that you are not living just for yourself. Before we even talk about marriage, you have realized that there is something that God is expecting from your life. There is a reason why he, you came to this earth. There is something that God wants you to fulfill in life as a man. And then you have prayed about it. You have known it. You now go to God and say, God, who is that lady that you have also prepared alongside? Who will help me to fulfill this? And can I tell you something? You know, people normally say that behind every successful man, there is a woman. And that behind every man that is not successful, you can be sure there is a woman. I can tell you something definitely. Marriage can make or mar your life. Marriage can build or destroy you. Destroy everything about you. Marriage can make you happy. And on the other hand, it can make you very, very sorrowful in life. So courtship begins when a brother has prayed. And by the different ways that we have talked about, God has spoken to you that this particular sister is the one he has prepared to help you along your life, to build you up, to add to you, to make you better. You have talked to your pastors, you have talked to your disciples, they have prayed with you. They have given you a go-ahead to propose to the sister. And then you go ahead as a brother and make a formal proposal to the sister. You allow her to pray. And also to discuss with her own pastors and disciples. When she has prayed and she has come back to say, Okay, I have also prayed and I have discovered by this means and this means and this means that I am the one that should help you to fulfill the will of God for your life. And the two of us agree together. That is when we commit ourselves to ourselves and to God and to the fulfillment of the purpose of God for our lives. That is when courtship begins. So the difference between dating and courtship is that courtship involves commitment between two people, between the two of them, first and foremost between the two of them, and then between the two of them and God. But dating is just a friendship. We are still testing. We are not yet sure. And we can drop it along the line. <laughs> I can break your heart the way I like it. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Dating is not biblical. Dating is not correct for anybody who is born again and who understands and know the purpose of God for marriage. I'm praying that God will help you. Praise the Lord. Uh, I would like to talk on the issue of um, intertribal marriage. Sir, as a Yoruba lady, if God is directing me to an Igbo man as my husband, and my parents insisted that I should not marry him because he is an Igbo man, in this situation, what should I do? Should I disobey my parents and marry him because God has directed me to him? And a similar question, sir. We know that God has good plans for his children. But how about a Yoruba man led to marry a Fulani woman? And their culture is that the man must be beaten on the wedding day. <laughs> on the wedding day. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> praise the Lord. Um, what we have said is that uh, she is not even sure whether it's true. 
And what we have said is that in Christ, there is no Jew, no Gentile, no barbarian. What we have said here so far is that the best thing, the first thing you should do is to know how God is leading you to your partner. Whether the person is, irrespective of tribe, can even be a white man or a white lady. The important thing is that you have been able to follow, verify that this is the will of God for me. And if God is leading you to someone who is not from your tribe, and the parents are saying no, whether the person is even a Nigerian or another African country, or even a white person, what you should do if you are sure that God is leading you, time will prove that it is actually God leading you. We don't advise that you disobey your parents at the first instance. Actually, some parents, it's not because they don't want you to marry. They are just being protective according to their own understanding. They are only trying to show that they are concerned. That you should not get into trouble. Maybe as they did. So as a child of God, what you should do is to go into prayer. And fasting as it may be. On, and be patient for God to convince uh, such parents until such a time with time and with prayer and with patience God will touch them to change their mind. However, we have seen some extreme cases where after much waiting and prayer we had a couple like that the father of the lady still refused that that lady must not marry that man because the lady is from Niger Delta, the brother is from the north. And the man himself, the father of the lady was actually an occultic man and he did everything possible to stop that marriage. So when we saw that the man was adamant, not because the brother is not God's friend, he just refused. After waiting and praying for years, where they had to marry without their parents' consent. However, after that marriage, after many years, the man repented and accepted them, and they now came back to come and do all the traditional rites that should be done. So what we are saying is that inter-tribal marriage, it does, there's nothing like in Christianity, the important thing is that that person that God has shown you is a child of God, and that you have ascertained that it is the will of God for you. Parental consents are important, but if you run into difficulty with that, you must wait and pray and allow God. Yes, you should talk to your pastor and just hold on. You must not be arrogant and say, well, I don't give a damn if my parents don't care to hell with them. That is not correct because you yourself, one day, you become a parent. And if your children both away like that and marry, definitely you are not going to bless them. And we need your parents to bless you as they go into marriage. However, like we have said, when you have prayed correctly and God helping you, they will eventually agree and give you their consent and the marriage will be fine. Praise the Lord. We want to be rounding up now. Um... Just to touch one, two, three issue, pa, 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 and we pray. Uh, first, there is a question here, which I don't think we will answer from here. But because the person that wrote it didn't put name, I will just read it out. If you are the person, you need to see us privately. Said, it is so unfortunate that as a young girl, I have suffered ignorance. I enter into a relationship driven by lust, even when I did not pray. When the brother came I t and told me, God said to him that I was the one meant for him. I entered into covenants ignorantly. He made me commit a lot of atrocity, sin. And now I have grown to realize that it was driven by lust. Because I never loved him. And he made me commit sin against God. But I am afraid to break the relationship. Because of the covenants. Please help me. What should I do? Come and see us. Uh, either this night after the meeting or you see us during counseling tomorrow any of us and there are other issues we read here which we felt they are counseling issues they are not dealing with the principles that we have laid so if your 
your question was not attended to, you can see us either after the meeting tonight or during counseling tomorrow, specifically on marital issues. Then, I also want to touch on the uh, courtship that our sister started because there are questions here that talk about courtship. Now, courtship, like we wrote in the paper here, there's a paper we give to you. Courtship is necessary after you have uh, discovered that you are prayed and you are meant for each other. You need to now give time between the time you agree and the marriage proper. And we have always said the courtship should not be too long. It should not be too short. And we said one year is ideal. Don't rush into it before one year. And except for um, special reasons for one thing or the other, don't run a courtship for too long. That is going to three years, four years, five years, because there are some, there are some questions here that bothers on relationships that are lasting for five years. That is not uh, good. But during courtship, the time of courtship is meant to understand each other a little bit, to confirm your convictions, to discuss your vision for your future home, to pray together, and to go for counseling or training on obvious issues that will affect the marriage, on such as finances, the different roles of husband and wife, the in -law, managing in-laws and extended family system, and other issues like um, sex, communications. You need to subject yourself to such training if your church is offering it or anywhere you can get it. Those of you that are living in Lagos, when the time comes and you want to get married, contact Peace House Office. We run a class for eternity couples twice every month so that you can be put through uh, uh, according to the principles of the Bible and as part of your preparation for the marriage. That's what you do during courtship. Now, there's a question here about during courtship. Is it correct to hold hands to do this? We want to say that uh, courtship is not equal to marriage. Until you are married, you are not yet married. And for a Christian, there are three procedures that must happen before you, you can touch each other. Number one, you have to do what we call traditional marriage. And the time here is not here to talk about that. But you must go and ask for your wife, pay the dowry, pay all the necessary things that are biblical. Don't give alcohol and all that things that are offensive to the Bible. And the father of the girl must hand her over to you during the day or publicly in the presence of many people. Secondly, go for court registration to get a license to wed because that validates it lawfully in the Nigerian law system. The other one is traditional marriage, which the, the Nigerian law also recognizes. But you need to go to court to do registry and then collect the license to wed. Then go to church. Your church will wed you. The ministers of God will pronounce you, husband and wife, pray for you in the midst of many, many people. Then after that, they give you a certificate of marriage. That is when you can touch. That is when you can kiss. That is when you can do some other things. Hallelujah. But there are some of you here. You are not yet married. You are not even in proper courtship. You have gone beyond what you should do. Tonight, we are going to pray. Because if you have involved in that extramarital sex, if you have not yet repented of it, you have already spoiled your, your future home. Because the Bible said, the bed, the marriage bed must not be defied. Because one mongers and adulterers, God will judge. So it is not correct if you are a girl here. You are already sleeping around. You have broken your virginity. You have, you, have, you have defiled yourself. That is not correct. And those of you that, are not, that have not defiled yourself, we want to use the forum to tell you that the will of God for you is that you remain like that. You remain pure, holy, 
a virgin until you get married. Don't let all the kind of teachings that are going on or bad counseling telling you that, well, this and this. I don't want to repeat what they are telling you here. But the will of God is that every young man, every young lady remain pure, remain a virgin until you get properly married. Because in the Old Testament, if it was discovered that a girl has already been defiled, she was supposed to be stoned to death. And the same thing with the man. Go and read Leviticus. You will find it there. So, you, are, you owe God the duty to remain pure and holy. You owe your husband, your future husband, your future wife, and your future home the duty to remain pure so that God can bless your marriage.